Howard Hunter left an extraordinary legacy in his research of papermaking history and the publication of his remarkable books. He was an incredible person. The first Dard Hunter book I read was History and Techniques of an Ancient Craft, which I never read thoroughly. I used it as a great reference book. So when I began my own travels in 1976 to explore papermaking in Asia, I relied on other sources of information, mostly rumors and a few friends. By the early 1980s, I began to acquire and read Dard Hunter's other books and realized what places he visited and thoroughly documented. As the years went by, I continued to track down hand paper making, primarily in areas that Dard Hunter did not visit. But inevitably, I did explore the same places, and I want to tell you what I found. Dard Hunter's first trip to Asia was his venture to the South Sea Islands in 1926, where he was eager to see the making of bark paper. This is the same as bark cloth. When the early explorers saw people wearing clothes made from pounded bark, they called it bark cloth. Those who saw that material used for writing called it bark paper. First, Dard Hunter's ship took him to Tahiti and the Cook Islands, but the making of bark paper had already ceased. However, in Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa, he had great success. Sixty-four years later, in 1990, I traveled to Samoa and Tonga. The whole complex of islands was incredibly beautiful, just as Dard Hunter described, and bark paper was still being produced in exactly the same fashion. In Samoa, I made inquiries and learned that I could find bark paper being made on the island of Savai. It was only a ten-minute flight, but it was frightening. The Savai airfield had been washed away, and the pilot had to navigate over treetops to locate a tiny plot of cleared land in the middle of the jungle. We did land safely. After a tour of the island, we visited the one remaining bark paper enterprise. The art had been kept alive through the efforts of a dedicated woman, and she had three women engaged in production. They worked in the traditional manner, stripping the inner bark of the paper mulberry tree. The trees are cultivated so that they grow straight and side branches are not allowed to grow. The black outer bark is stripped off and the strips of bast fiber are beaten into sheets. The sheets are pounded together to achieve the desired size and finally are decorated using stencils made from coconut fiber and dyes obtained from local plants. All the work now is produced just for sale to tourists, not for Samoans. And then we flew to Tonga, where nothing had changed since Dard Hunter's time. As soon as we entered Nuka Alofa, the capital city, we heard the rhythmic beating of mulberry fiber. The Tongan women are constantly at work, making natu, Tonga's word for the large pieces of finished bark paper called tapa in Samoa. Unlike Samoa, the natu is a vital part of Tongan culture, used as wrappings for the dead, offerings in ceremonies, bed coverings, wall hangings, gifts for important occasions such as weddings or birth of a baby, and occasionally for special ceremonial clothing. I spent a week in the small village of Fazi, first watching the women making the bark paper and then sitting among them working on a piece myself. I went to the market to buy some mulberry branches so I could start right from the beginning and experience the entire process. At the market I discovered that one could purchase every stage of the process, not only branches but also coils of inner bark, pieces of beaten bark, and even the entirely finished natu. I bought a bundle of branches and returned to Fazi. I selected one big branch, peeled off the bast, scraped the outer bark, coiled it up, soaked it in water, and then started beating. As the bark spread out and got thinner, I folded it over and beat it more. After several hours, I had one finished section called a fetaaki, 
and hung it on a line to dry. In that time period, the Tongan women could each complete three sections. Finally, I spent a day watching the women sitting around a huge table as they put together one woman's completed fetaakis to make one huge natu. I saw the women glue the pieces together using manioc root. Then they rubbed the bark paper with a dark brown dye, which brought up the pattern of the stencil underneath the natu. When the whole piece was finished, its owner took it home to further decorate it. Dart Hunter described this whole scene also, both in Samoa and Tonga. Dart Hunter made his second major expedition to Asia in 1933, planning to explore Japan first with a side trip to Korea and China. He prepared very well in advance for the Japanese venture. His trip was organized by the OG Paper Company. Officials of the company traveled with him, and he explored Japanese papermaking extensively, witnessing traditional processes in villages around Kochi and Kawanoe on Chikoku Island, and Gifu, Osaka, Nara, Kyoto, Nagoya, and Ogawa. My first papermaking expedition to Japan occurred in 1976, where I was helped by Asao Shimura. In Tokyo, we went to the Oji Company and visited their wonderful museum. We talked with the directors and inspected their extensive library. There we met the venerable Saikichiro Goto, a talented artist who wrote books about handmade paper and printed them on his own handmade paper reminiscent of Dard Hunter's works. Mr. Goto invited us to visit. The first papermaking village we explored was Agawamachi, where we found papermaking flourishing, but not on the large scale that Dard Hunter described in the villages he visited. This was the first time I had witnessed the Nagashizuki method of papermaking, which I found amazing and I saw all the other processes. I watched an elderly lady picking off bits of black bark from kozo fiber, rinsing it in icy water, and warming her hands on a charcoal burner. I saw a mechanical stamper in action. Here the papermaker has just added pulp to his vat and is dispersing it with a maze. And he's preparing neri, straining the formation aid. After the sheets were formed, a screw press was used, and then the sheets were either brushed onto wood boards and dried in the sun, or were brushed onto heated metal plates. After Agawa Machi, our next destination was Kuratane Machi, by train and bus. On the way, however, against the backdrop of Mount Fuji, we stopped at Fuji no Miya, where Mr. Goto lived, and took a taxi to his workshop. His Mitsumata trees were in full bloom, and here is Mr. Goto in his studio. We watched him making paper and inspected his equipment. In Tokyo, I already had bought one of his beautiful handmade books about Japanese papermaking. Then we reached Kyoto and took the bus to Kuratani Machi. The village was essentially a cooperative enterprise with 40 families engaged in papermaking. We walked up the dirt roads alongside the small river that runs through the village. We watched one woman rinsing fiber, saw stampers at work, and observed a worker putting the beaten fiber into a naginata. This elderly lady was making special paper for obi wrappers. By coincidence, though, we had arrived on a day when most people were involved in producing tie-dyed paper from sheets they had previously made. We watched the whole process of tying the paper with knots, making the dye stuffs, dipping the paper into the dye baths, hanging on lines, and finally untying the knots. Now this was 1976. We returned in 2002, 26 years later, with Richard Flavin to help us, and tremendous changes had occurred in both villages. In Agawamachi, there was only one papermaker left, Haruo Kubo, in addition to Richard, plus a school for papermaking. 
but only one student was working there. They did have a beautiful gift shop and little museum, although most of the paper for sale came from other places. In Kuratani Machi, the 40 paper-making families had now dwindled to 10, and the whole look of the village had changed. The roads on each side of the little river were completely paved. Most of the houses looked very new, and nearly every house had a paved driveway for the owner's car. There was not much activity on the day we arrived, although we noticed some people drying paper by brushing the sheets on boards and putting them outside in their garden. In other years, we have documented more villages in Japan, although not as extensively as Dard Hunter. We've spent time in Kawanoe on Shikoku Island and observed the papermaker Mr. Uda. North of Tokyo, in Yamagata town, we visited the workshop of Aijiro Kikuchi. And I know from others that there is still a lot of traditional papermaking in Japan, but the situation is changing. Papermaking is hard work, and young people look for more profitable employment. Another factor is competition from other countries. In 2004, we went to Nagatomi, a small town west of Tokyo, to observe a semi-automatic method of sheet formation. This was patented in Japan some years ago, but my Japanese friends have not seen this used by other traditional Japanese papermakers. However, the method has been adopted in Korea and in Thailand, and this may prove a real threat to production in Japan. When Dard Hunter left Japan, he planned to make side trips to Korea and China. First, his ship landed in Pusan, in southern Korea. He wrote that he visited a number of hand papermaking villages in that area, finding that traditional Korean papermaking had virtually disappeared, and the papermakers had already adopted Japanese methods. But he learned that the oldest form of Korean papermaking could still be seen in Ompe on the way to Seoul. He found those papermakers who made large sheets from mulberry fiber. These were coated with oil for use as floor coverings in Korean homes. His trip to Korea lasted only 10 days. He returned to Japan and sailed back to the U.S., omitting the trip to China. My first contact with Korea was at the time I met this person in 1950. In due time, I married him, and he has been my photographer ever since. My first experience with Korean papermaking occurred in 1980, nearly 50 years later, in Boston. That year, I organized a seminar of international papermaking, and among the invited papermakers was Kim Yeon Yeon from Wanju, Korea. Kim had brought with him a mold and gave a wonderful demonstration of the old style of traditional Korean papermaking. In 1989, I went to Korea to observe the papermaking scene. Unfortunately, Kim had died a few years before, and his papermaking enterprise in Wanju had stopped operations. But I was able to locate the papermakers who made the oiled floor paper in the village of Song Wang Myon. There were 50 papermaking houses there, and I watched the entire process of papermaking. It was Japanese style, just as Dard Hunter had seen in Pusan. And I documented how they oiled the paper, which now they did with the help of a machine. In 2004, I returned to Korea to the city of Jeonju, which is the most active papermaking center. It was 15 years later, and now there was a notable difference. I visited two hand paper mills. First was the Gokung paper mill, a very large operation. I videoed one of the paper makers forming sheets in the Japanese fashion, not really different from my 1989 experience and Dard Hunter's in 1933. But then I saw the small paper mill of Kankapsok, 
and to my astonishment, I recognized immediately he was using the semi-automatic method of sheet formation that was invented in Nagatomi, Japan. Kang told me that he built the vat and its mechanics himself. I didn't ask him if he knew about the Japanese patent. So that is the state of hand paper making in Korea today. Dard Hunter's third voyage in 1935 resulted in two books, Papermaking in Southern Siam, published in 1936, and Papermaking in Indochina, published much later in 1947. The trip was more than four months long. He traveled first to Indochina, specifically to Hanoi. He found traditional papermakers working in the villages of Longbui and Yentai, known as Les Villages du Papier. When I explored Vietnam in 1987, Les Villages du Papier seemed to have disappeared. After quite an adventure, I discovered what happened. The papermakers of Longbui and Yentai had been forced to work in a government collective. We located the factory and found papermaking had not changed very much from Dard Hunter's time. Just as he described, the fine mulberry or zaw paper was made on molds of the same configuration. A wood frame supports a bamboo screen and a U-shaped decal sets on top. Sheets of paper were couched without any interleaving cloths. However, at the same collective, I documented low-grade paper made from recycled scraps and sheets were formed on a different type of mold. It was simply a wood frame covered with woven wire and no decal was used. In this case, each sheet of paper was couched onto a thin piece of cloth. The fine paper was pressed with a rock-operated press, very similar to what Dard Hunter photographed. A screw press, however, was used for the sheets that had been interleaved with fabric. For drying, we saw workers putting the damp paper on poles, and then the poles were brought outside to dry. In the year 2000, I went back to Hanoi, and the paper-making situation had changed again. The commune had been dismantled, and papermakers could work independently, but there were very few of them. We located what had been the village of Longbui, now a suburb of Hanoi, and we managed to find two workshops where low-grade paper was made. This worker was using the same type of mold we had seen in the collective in 1987. In the town of Dong Kao, east of Hanoi, I documented the fine Zor paper that was still made on the same type of mold with the U-shaped decal that Dard Hunter described. The fiber also was prepared in the same way, soaked in lime, then cooked, but now there was a large beta. However, Dodd Hunter had also described a type of beta in 1935, along with a stamper. We no longer saw the rock-operated press, only a manual screw press. After Dodd Hunter's adventures in North Vietnam, which he called Tonkin, he got back on a ship and sailed to Singapore, and from there took a train to Bangkok. He had the right government guide, and they took a marvelous ride through the narrow canals of Bangkok and managed to find the one remaining papermaking family in the village of Bang Son. Fifty-one years later, in 1986, I also found this family of papermakers, although I came by taxi. I could scarcely believe that I was truly there at the identical place that Dard Hunter had visited. The house was unchanged, and I met the two Niltongam sisters, daughters of Pyun Niltongam, whom Dard Hunter had met, and they still made paper in the canal behind their house. We watched the whole process, cleaning the inner bark of the koi tree, beating the fiber, and forming sheets right in the canal. The Thai word is klong.
After a sheet of paper is formed, the paper maker takes the mold out of the clong and rolls a stick over the wet paper. Then it dries in the sun. Now I tried to make a sheet of paper. The sisters gave me a sarong to wear, and I walked right into the clong and hoped to emulate their process. But the clong has a current, and I had to hold the mold to keep it from floating away. Also, my sarong was ballooning out, and I tried to restrain it. I managed to put the ball of pulp in the basket, filling it with clong water and dispersing it. Then I poured it over the mold and tried in vain to disperse the pulp evenly on the mold. I even tried the technique of pouring a basket of water over the mold. It was a complete disaster. Then I noticed the two sisters sitting on the bank of the clong, absolutely hilarious, bursting with laughter. Making paper in a clong needs a lot of practice. A few years later, I learned sadly that the sisters had stopped making paper and moved away. Dard Hunter's final expedition, his fourth, was a trip to India in 1937. It resulted in the 1939 publication of Paper Making by Hand in India. When Dard Hunter reached Asia, he landed in Karachi, which is now Pakistan, and worked his way north, also visiting Bangladesh, and finally reached Srinagar and documented Kashmiri papermaking in Naushira. The other place he describes in his book was the visit to the papermaking school in Wardha, which was established by Mahatma Gandhi, and he actually had an interview with the great man. In 1978, I made my first trip to India. Most exciting was finding traditional papermaking in Sanganer, near the city of Jaipur. At the entrance to the mill, we saw a group of Indian women picking through piles of rope and fabric, selecting the suitable pieces that would be used to make paper. Inside, the manager showed us samples of their paper, and we toured the facilities. We saw the large beta they used for pulping, and when I asked if they added sizing to their paper, we all went outside and the manager showed us the remains of an animal. They buy the carcass of a cow, cook it, and extract the animal glue that is the sizing. Sheet formation was very interesting, and it was done in exactly the same way that Dard Hunter described in his account of the Kashmiri papermakers in Naushira. The mold was a wood framework with a screen on top, held securely by two deckle sticks. The worker sat in front of the vat, dipped the mold vertically into the pulp, then drew up a layer of pulp on the mold, leveled it out, and cooched the sheet onto a felt. The post of papers was dried in a hydraulic press, and finally each sheet was removed from the post and hung up to dry either outside or inside the mill. Later, the sheets were calendared, as we see here. The manager showed us the finished products and then arranged a demonstration of the paper's strength. In 1986, we had another opportunity to travel to northern India, and I made a supreme effort to locate the Kashmiri papermakers of Naushira. We landed in Delhi, and allowed ourselves to be picked up by one of the touts hanging around, Rashid Dongola from Srinagar. He arranged for us to stay at his father's houseboat on Dal Lake, and then he would be our guide. It worked out well. We lived for several days on the HB Gulfam, taking a comfortable shikara over to Srinagar while Rashid made inquiries about Naushira. As it turned out, Naushira, which means new city, is simply a suburb of Srinagar. Rashid located a man, Mr. Peshin, who knew where the papermakers lived. The four of us drove over there, and it was like my experience in Bangsom, Thailand. There was the identical house that Dard Hunter had photographed in 1937. This is the back of the house. When Dard Hunter was there, it was the front. But now the paper makers had become prosperous. They were merchants. So they built a new front, which we see here. <laughs>
We walked in and were introduced to a very elderly man lying on a mat. He sat up and began a long story about the history of Kashmiri paper and his own hand paper making. Another man showed us wonderful sheets of the old paper that he still possessed. The room filled up with dozens of curious people. It was quite an event. I taped the entire lecture he gave, and later Mr. Peshin translated the tape into English for me. Now I asked if there were any artifacts remaining. A man demonstrated the knife arrangement they used to cut the cotton cloth. I saw the mortar and huge wooden pestle that was used in one stage of beating. But they explained that most of the beating was done by a stamper that was located in a small river several miles away. The pulp was formed into cakes called mond and dried. Then it was transported to the paper makers. They showed me the room where originally there was a clay pit in which the mond and water was put. See the outline on the floor where the pit had been filled in. Workers stood in the pit and tread on the mond to disperse the pulp to get it ready for sheet forming. An important characteristic of Kashmiri paper is its smooth, hard surface, and a man demonstrated how this was done. Rice starch was applied to the paper with a glove. Then it was burnished with a stone. I bought this book from Mr. Peshin, which is manuscript on this special Kashmiri paper. Next, we went to look for the stampa where the pulp had been beaten, and Rashid found that place at the river Arak that Dad Hunter described. The stampa had washed away, but we saw the mortar that remained. The onlookers who gathered around us remembered the stampa in use. The other great event that Dard Hunter relates was his visit to the papermaking school in Warda, where he met Mahatma Gandhi. I didn't go to Wardha on my expeditions, but I did visit hand paper mills in Ahmedabad and Pondicherry. I learned that in accordance with Gandhi's wishes, these and others had been set up specifically to give employment to many poor people who needed work. The techniques grew out of the experiments and teaching at Wardha. In Ahmedabad, we saw this new technique of paper making that had been developed, use of a decal box. The mold is a wood frame with a wire cover with a high wood decal around it. It sits in a vat of water. I watched the worker pour a bucket of pulp onto the mold. He dispersed the pulp with his hands, then pressed a lever to bring the mold up from the water, shook the mold somewhat to further level the sheet, then removed the decal and cooched the sheet. Dard Hunter did not describe this method, so it probably evolved some time after his visit. It is much easier to make paper this way than what Dard Hunter had seen in Naushera and I had seen in Sanganea. I also saw this method used in Pondicherry, and it certainly serves its purpose to make hand paper making much easier. Dard Hunter's final visit was to the city of Agra, where the Taj Mahal is located. He knew that at one time a lot of paper making could be found in this area. He discovered this was no longer true, but he did find one very old man, the last living paper making there, Mr. Wasbooks, who said paper making had ceased there seven years before. I think all people interested in papermaking realize the enormous debt we owe to Dard Hunter for his extraordinary documentation of traditional papermaking under very difficult circumstances. And I am thrilled to have had the opportunity to witness many of the same places. <laughs> <laughs>